I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Nicolas Gatto from uh, Swedish uh, Agricultural University, uh, University of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Swedish, yeah, of agricultural sciences, I guess. That's agricultural sciences, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to talk about butterfly wing evolution at macroevolutionary scale. So, yep. Please Thank enjoy, you. Nicolas. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, first of all, uh, to Christy for inviting me uh, today. Um, thanks also for the whole uh, team organizing the, the uh, meeting and the fantastic talks. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be talking during 45 minutes. Um, I, I wasn't exactly sure what to be talking today uh, for different reasons, but one of the reasons is um well because Christy impacted me because there was this got some uh, data set that I had been working on and published and so I wasn't exactly sure what would be my contribution to this group these days and uh, what to talk about today um so I've decided to focus to make a talk really focused on uh, the data I have so not going necessarily into details methodological details or theoretical ecological details. Um, so I think I, I'm, I'm not going to be talking very, very long. And the other reason why um, um, I'm not necessarily talking very long is because uh, I'm not coming with um, extraordinary new data, new papers, new ideas, because I, I, I work on many different things. Um, I use a lot of different types of data, different types of questions coming from ecological niche evolution, biography, species interaction. I work with mimicry, um, host plant evolution with butterflies, also um, currently working on human influence on population trends in butterflies. Um, and all and, and I'm more of a phylogeneticist by training. And I try to combine all these kinds of information to better understand both species diversity and phenotypic diversity. But the morphometric side of things is very, just, just a small fraction of what I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing. And it's even worse because uh, I mostly worked on um, uh, morphometric data when I was doing back, uh, when I was doing my PhD. And since then, because of some postdocs, that, different postdocs project that drove, drove me away from the morphometric side, I actually ended up having a lot of data remaining sitting on my computer and basically not working anymore with this kind of, um, of questions or very slowly. So I'm actually super happy also to be here today because I'm, I feel like I'm trying to reconnect with, with that side of my research and hopefully um, develop that more in the, in the near future. Um, so first I wanted to, to, to make a little introduction with the butterflies, I guess. Everybody knows more or less what a butterfly looks like. And, and um, But I just wanted to say we have about more than 80,000 species of butterflies uh, described. Um, and they're very well known. They're very charismatic, obviously. They're probably one of the best known group of uh, insects. They're distributing in seven families, whatever. But we have an extremely poor fossil record. And I wanted to mention that because uh, we, we, all these three, three days we've been talking a lot about fossil information, um, um, including or reconstructing shape from um, hypothesis that we might have, or not hypothesis, but actual data that we have from the past, from the fossil record. And that's something we do not have access to with butterflies, and we will Never. So for more than 18,000 uh, species of butterflies nowadays, we have only 48 fossil specimens that I, I call to the species that have all, but it's just basically good enough for uh, providing some information about their uh, taxonomic placement. And it's actually even an overestimation because among these 48 fossils, many of them are not even informative of anything, probably, uh, for example, because they are too, too young to even provide any kind of interesting uh, information. So, and, and, and so, so they're basically only used for helping us time with the grading phylogenesis of some factor. 
and and we, we usually use only somewhere between 10 and 15 fossils to calibrate time uh, time trees and that's really the only most the only informative um, uh, fossils we actually have so basically when we want to understand what is the evolution of butterflies uh, in deep time uh, it, we basically must only rely on exome taxa, on molecular phylogenies that we try to find calibrate the best we can, and on models of evolution that can provide us with some hypothesis or some inference on what happened in the past, uh, which is often precise in reviews and is extremely difficult, I think, when we usually end up with reviewers coming from the vertebrate side who say you don't have fossils to to prove whatever you're you're talking about, and it's extremely frustrating because it's not like we can come up with the fossils and invent them. But we just don't have any other choice. So we need to 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 trust the method we have. And I always say that we we use the best method we have at a, at a point t in time. And if better methods come later and 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 say we were wrong, I, I wouldn't mind. I would have any no problem about that. But we just have to accept that at some point we use the best we have, and, and that's how science works. But so we don't have any possible around. And the other, uh, my other uh, uh, rant about butterflies and, and going on is about how delayed the insect community is when it comes to macroevolutionary studies and especially about phenotypes. Uh, I'm, I'm taking this example here of uh, that um, that paper because I think it, it was really highlighting to me the gap there is between the insect community and the vertebrate community. So here you have this amazing data set generating by crowd, um, uh, I mean, crowd generated um, uh, data for build shape and being able to infer at the scale of, of, of the super large value of birds, uh, um, diversification of shapes, etc. And I, I, I just take by for comparison that paper that isn't that that a long time ago, where they studied body size evolution in insects, and their data set was 774 taxa. And we're talking about insects here, so one billion species described and maybe somewhere between five and ten billion species uh ex extant species uh, around the world so that is makes me a little bit laughing when i see this kind of data and even in a, in a group like butterflies we don't even have the data compiling even a trait as simple as body size information so even in the most well-known group of insects we don't even have a data set of body size information which to me, remains very a mystery of how, how we still don't have this data. So I know now it's, 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 it's being slowly processed, but I just wanted to point out the fact that we, when, when you come to the insect uh, world, uh, the amount of information we have, the amount of literature we have is extremely, extremely poor compared to the vertebrate side. So when, we, when I hear about talking about uh, uh, what is it, the term that you use, phenomics? I mean, in insects, we are not even at the phenotypic level. <laughs> um, so even with, with simple trait, we don't have a lot of data. So even with, so if you go to more complex shape, it's, it's even, uh, it's even uh, lower. So I'm going to talk uh, of one of these few data sets that um, exist, which are about for more complex traits. Uh, and it's based on three papers that we've published and that are relying on more or less the same data set that I generated during my PhD. And this uh, data set focuses on a very charismatic group of butterflies that you probably have seen already. These are the morpho butterflies, it's these large blue iridescent uh, butterflies that are living in new tropics. Uh, some of them, like this one, is uh, among the, or if, if not the largest butterfly, uh, excellent butterfly um, on Earth. And none of them are all blue iridescent, but any species are. Um, and their ventral side here, you see, is much more uh, brownish with just some patterning and some eye spots on it. 
So there are really cool butterflies. They're not very diverse. It's only a 30, 30 species. They're relatively well known in terms of, uh, of taxonomy and, 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 and uh, systematics. And, um, and basically what we did <laughs> is that when I was doing my PhD at the uh, Museum of Paris, we basically had a really nice, uh, probably one of the best collection for more butterflies. We have uh, uh, Patrick Blondin, who is uh, probably one of the um, best specialists for more butterflies who has been curating that collection. So we used a fantastic um, source of information we had to generate a, a data set of, of wing shape um, for the entire group, basically. So we took pictures of um, males and females, uh, both dorsal and ventral side, which allowed us to have both fore and hind wing shape information. Uh, we had much less females because females are much more rare, or we don't know if they are rare or if they're just hiding better, um, but they're more rare in the collections of these. And we have males and females for all species, except for one species, more for healthy, for which a female has actually never been, uh, has never ever been uh, caught. So it remains a mystery. And basically we uh, quantify wing shapes. Um, in butterflies, we usually focus on landmarks at vein intersection and intersection between veins and uh, margins. But you can see that you still miss part of the shape. So we added some sliding landmarks as well to describe the front and rear uh, margin of the forewing and the uh, front uh, end of the, of the hind wing. We also use <clears throat> sliding landmarks to measure the depth of these uh, small shapes that uh, that can be more or less uh, deep here. And we had some uh, information and this, I was less involved in, in, in getting the data here of eye spots. So the, these, these uh, spherical shapes that you have on the ventral side. So we measured eye spot number, position, size, and, and shape across most of the species. We try to combine this shape information with as much Additional information we had, uh, pathology, um, biography information, and one especially strong ecologic, uh, ecological factor that we wanted to try to test was related to microhabitat use, because we have something really um, well characterized is one entire group of multiple butterflies who are tend to fly really high above ground, so at the scale and the level of the canopy, and they tend to have or uh, many of them like this one, a, a very particular um, um, flight behavior where they they are gliding a lot and just flap wings from time to time. Whereas the rest of the species, they tend to be flying in the story. Uh, you can see them patrolling on rivers and flying among trees with a much more uh, flappy uh, flight behavior and much more maneuverable flight behavior. Now I'm gonna uh, disclaimer right now. We are in the worst case scenario possible for comparative analysis because our uh, what I call the canopy species are all grouped in a single plane. So worst scenario possible, but that's how the data is. So we have to to deal with that. But uh, but uh, yeah. So we wanted to try to test um, the link between <coughs> this microhabitat use and shape evolution, uh, wing shape evolution, or wing size evolution, um, for obvious reason, because flight is obviously linked to the shape of wings. So I, I've just gathered some of, uh, just some results here and some figures to give you an overview of our results. Here is a mortal space for uh, fore and hind wing with uh, species position, uh, average species position. And for both fore and hind wing, we found strong Microhabitat uh, structuring. Um, uh, and this is not necessarily visible here on the both on the first few axes here for four wing, but it's very strong on the hind wing here. On PC axis two, you have this. Um, the whole canopy group is basically at the top here and the uh, understory group uh, here. So very strong structuring um, by microhabitat uh, for both wings. 
it, but microhabitat didn't have any effect on uh, wing size. I'll come back to wing size right after. We also wanted to test whether this effect of microhabitat was um, maybe via the, 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 the adaptation uh, to fly, different fly behaviors had also an effect on uh, uh, foreign hindwing integration. So we, we tested for that. Here you have the, the plot for all the individuals. And here, when we uh, use, uh, when we refine it to average uh, species, and there seemed to be very strong integration of both wings with um, canopy wings being uh, very more, much more pointy and elongated towards the apex and much more rounded uh, wings for um, short and rounded wings for nearly the story species, which is what you expect if you want more. Uh, as far as I understand the biophysics here, if you want more maneuverable flight, that's what you want these rounded um, shape, whereas if you want more gliding flight, you want elongated uh, wings. Uh, but that structuring of uh, wing integration uh, disappeared when we um, took phylogenetic um, structure into account. Um, so we, we suggest that the covariation between foreign high wing is a, is a particularly strongly driven by this, this uh, adaptation to microhabitat. Now this, this, what I've shown here was when we were trying to understand how microhabitat was changing um, the shape and the size, but we were also interested in understanding how shape and size, um, the, the rate of evolution of shape and size had been changing within the tree. So identifying whether some specific groups uh, had been um, changing the rate of evolution uh, in, in a very exploratory uh, way. Uh, so we used for body size this alter uh, program at the time, which uh, accommodates either evolutionary rate changes or uh, evolutionary jumps. So very rapid evolutionary changes that occur in a short amount of time. And what we found is a very strong signal for a single evolutionary chunk of body size only in females in this specific plate here. So here's the uh, is a phenogram of body size of wing size, sorry. And um, and you see this clade here, which is not the canopy plate that I was talking about. So this group that has very significantly smaller uh, wing size than the less. And so we found this evolutionary jump in this ancestor and we were not sure what it related to, but um, what we found to be correlating with that specific branch is actually a major post plant change. So all these species are feeding on hippocotyledons, uh, whereas these ones have actually shifted to monocots. So a major evolutionary um, change happening here, which we think is linked to um, uh, the, we, we suggest is linked to the um, body size evolution. And that might, might actually be related to the microhabitat because they live uh, in bamboo, uh, very thick, dense uh, bamboo forests. Um, and so that might relate to um, um, wing size adaptation. But we, and then we tried to do something similar with shape. We wanted to explore rate of shape evolution variation. And I, I'm a little bit of shame of presenting that what we did here today. Um, <laughs> but at the time we didn't know what to use. So there wasn't uh, proper tools for, for testing this. So what we tried to do is to use the comparable rate function geomorph, which allows you to assign different species to different groups. And so we use grouping feature to to, to um, go clay by clay and testing which, uh, and, and defining clays of different size, basically testing all possibilities of clay we have, and then reiterating on that to identify where um, rate variation were happening, where were the uh, most significant rate shifts. And once we've identified the first rate shift, we were adding a second shift by testing all possible uh, combinations. So that was very, <coughs> I would say, not, not 
the most elegant way of testing these things. But so here, what you see here are branches colored according to the rate we estimated when doing the first test with one shift. But not, not all this variation is, is we consider significant. It's only the green dots here where we found what we what we found as significant. So two decreasing rate of shape evolution in males here, um, which we had absolutely no idea uh, why that would have happened. And in females, a um, increasing rate of shape evolution in these um, clay here, which is actually part of this canopy clay. So whether it relates to this difference in microhabitat use is unclear, but um, it, it, it. All right, and like, like I said, we also looked at iSpot uh, data, so I was only uh, a bit less involved in that project, um, but we measured iSpot uh, configurations and, and numbers. And here you see, for example, um, morphospace space of iSpot uh, configuration. And you see a strong effect of microhabitat again, with the canopy species coming here, uh, forming with ice spots forming some kind of an L shape, and the uh, understory species here with PC axis uh, with, with, with wings along the uh, at the extreme of this PC axis being much more uh, aligned, ice spot being aligned. And what we tried to do is since we had identified that microhabitat was also involved in wing shape changes. We wanted to test whether this the change from a wing shape was responsible for that change in high spots um, um, configuration. So what you see here in green is the average understory shape, and in blue the average canopy shape. And basically, what we did is predict the position of the canopy high spots. When moving from when when uh, um, moving from a understory shape to a canopy shape, and so that's what we see here: the predicted position of these high spots, and that we can compare it with the predict the, the actually observed position of high spot in the canopy. And what you see that the difference is much stronger, which we uh, interpret as uh, additional. Uh, selective pressure that, that, that have actually acted on the ice spot configuration and not simply the deformation of the wings um, of the overall wing. Uh, we quantify ice spot uh, size and shapes, and uh, a, a quick interesting result we got was a negative relationship between ice spot size and the variation in shape and size. So the bigger the ice spots were, the more stable they were. Um, and we interpret that as different uh, selective pressure on them. The idea is that big ice spots and small ice spots probably have different roles and function. And so big ice spots are under much more um, stabilizing selection, probably because they uh, attract predation from birds probably to a different part of the body, whereas the smaller ice spots um, tend to be much more um, is, uh, used as some kind of pattern on the wings to sort of create, uh, um, um, or I have to say, um, I lost my words now. Um, To change the, the appearance of the butterfly for the, the predators. And so, uh, so probably creating a relaxed selection on the smaller ice spots. All right. That was for uh, these some results on these morpho butterflies. Um, and I'm going to finish here by presenting some of the unpublished um, things I have or uh, uh, data that I have just started creating, but not been working on for uh, quite a while now. The second thing was we tried to scale these analysis up to a large group called the Ifumini butterflies. Uh, it's another neotropical group, 
Um, they're often referred to as the glass wing butterflies because many of them have these um, transparent wings and also super cool uh, metallic colored uh, uh, chrysalids. Um, and in 2019, we published a, a pretty good phylogeny of the group. So even though it's a neotropical group of butterflies, they're actually relatively well known. And we have a nice phylogenetic framework now with almost uh, with more than 80% of the species included. So a very nice phylogenetic framework for um, addressing evolutionary questions. Um, they're also an interesting group because they're involved in what is called Valerian mimicry. Uh, so all the ecomini species are disgusting for their predators. And they use wing color patterns to advertise the predators of this of this toxicity. So the predators learn to recognize these butterflies, and once they've tried, they don't want to try again. And that leads to selection pressure on uh, coexisting species that uh, leads to convergence in color patterns. So that's what we see here. You have in each case a, a species of a different gen, uh, genus but they all still convert towards similar uh, color patterns. And that's actually a very strong uh, selection force because here you see, uh, this is all ecomini species, but here you even have convergence with uh, much more distantly related species, including some uh, moths. So it's very strong selective pressure that is that we're also uh, studying on how it, involve, how it uh, affects ecological niche evolution or distribution, uh, um, I don't know, species distribution. And what we tried to do was to uh, include some phenotypic analysis into uh, for these butterflies. Now, when we scale up uh, at a higher polygenic uh, scale, we have a problem in China that the structure of wing uh, changes. So, for example, here at the two examples of the mean, they just two different genera, but still closely related. And basically, just because of the uh, cell here transformation, we basically lock, lose some landmarks. And so, we quickly have a problem of finding uh, uh, a number of homologous landmarks when we when we increase the um, the taxonomic sampling. So what we did, uh, sampling, sorry. So what we did is forget about the internal structure and just focus on the outline using mostly sliding landmarks. So we went to the collections again and photographed uh, uh, 1,600 specimens, uh, uh, which represented about 300 species, so a decent number of species. Um, and uh, yeah, trying to get males and females, but that was a bit more uh, tricky, and both for and timing. And this is the data that has been uh, uh, waiting for me uh, for all these years. We had started making some preliminary uh, analysis based on a subset of the data. This, this was just a morpho, quick morpho space analysis with the average of each genes in the, in the in this morpho space. Uh, but I'm not going into details here um, because these primary analysis were, were crap. Um, um, but yeah, these are data that I need to, to, to go back into at some point, uh, but which I think are a very good uh, data set because of the sampling data we have and, and all the additional ecological information we can add on top of that. Um, and my one of my goal is also to scale that even at a high phylogenetic scale to the most uh, diverse family of butterflies. Um, we published last year a, a um, phylogenetic tree of all species of nymphalidae sequence today. Uh, so nymphalidae are more than 6,300 species. And we managed to compile molecular information for 2,800 species. So it's a massive tree. It's probably a one of the best 
phylogenetic framework we have for a group of insects of that size nowadays. Um, because there are very little number of insects uh, group with, with that number of species that have been so well uh, studied and so well sampled. So it's a fantastic uh, framework again. And I started compiling images for one day, being able to also um, study wing shape evolution. So I already had more than 9,000 photos, which includes already 2,000 species. Now the problem I have with these is also trying to find a way to efficiently extract wing shape information without clicking. Um, so I'm also working with some, uh, trying to find a way with other people on how we can automatically extract these, these uh, contours of uh, wings. And I, I will just finish in three minutes here on something that I realized actually yesterday morning when we were uh, discuss uh, discussing, and I just wanted to reintroduce that here to have maybe some people's thought uh, about, uh, about that. And that is what is called the nymphalic ground pan. Ground, ground uh, this is something that has been um, discussed for a very, very long time. It's the idea that on, on the ventral side of butterflies, and here let's focus on the nymphalids, there is a common uh, developmental um, pathway or developmental uh, background that is common to all butterflies, and only small modification of or bigger modification of from this common background leads you to explain any kind of color pattern on these ventral sites. So, um, and, and, and the diversity is, is huge in these ventral sites. You can even end up with uh, wings that are basically uh, almost without any patterning. But then you have all these eye spot lines that just change in terms of position or number. Then you sometimes have these, these uh, color band colors that are just um, homogeneous in across different species. So, you, so, so it's really where it came from this idea that there is a common um, developmental uh, background to all the species. And for example, some people have proposed some sort of sequences of, of evolutionary changes in these color patterns. So, this is an example here. You have the actual two examples of butterflies, and here the same ground plan. So this is the same species. And then they propose some um, shape transformation from this, how, how you go from this common ground plan to the actual uh, shape. And so you have even like the disappearance of that thing, of the little white band. Uh, uh, movement of these ones to form a line here, uh, disappears from ice spots, etc. So they need so so there is a hypothesis where you go from that common background and end up you can explain whatever uh, whatever uh, color pattern they are. And so I said that when we were talking yesterday morning and when you were showing um, changes in in. Um, uh, in, in, in shape and when we were, I mean, maybe, yeah, I just thought, thought about this, this idea of, of shape changes. I don't know how easy it, it will be, it will be to implement into a more uh, geometric uh, framework because of the very high variability, because you, you really need to take into account the fact that some things can entirely disappear from, from the wing. Um, but that's just uh, some thoughts that I just added uh, for, for if there are some interesting ideas in the room. Or, yeah. But I will just, uh, I will just finish here uh, by thanking again the entire group here and uh, for the time I've been uh, here. And just wanted to mention four main people that have been involved in these uh, projects that I've been mentioning. Stephen Panara, who was a, a master student at the time. Uh, Vincent Debar, who uh, was uh, the person who was um, helping with the geometric morphometry. 
side of things, Marian Miguel was my uh, supervisor as well, and Patrick Gona, who was the, um, this um, morpho uh, specialist. And thanks for everyone. We have questions for Nicola. Or we just move. It's Friday. Yeah, I'll ask you a question then. Um, so, how do, you, how do you calibrate the labor cost with such an incomplete cost of labor? So, I've got some million that we use as well. Um, we use the very little amount of problem information we have. So, I said, I think we need. In a recent time calibration, we made of the butterfly backbone, we had maybe 13 fossils that are kind of sparsely distributed. We even have some groups like the Lysinids where with absolutely zero fossil information. Um, we try to have also host plant time calibration points. So the idea here is that you have some groups of butterflies that are highly specialized, for example, in a family of plants. So we we add level information, assuming that the group of butterflies that is specialized in the group of plant hasn't been diversifying before the plant uh, appeared or diversified. So that gives us not a minimum age, but a maximum age for certain groups. Uh, so we try to compile to combine this fossil and host plant information the best we can. But um, yeah, it, it, it is very problematic and and we have this very uh, characteristic problem where the oldest uh, fossil we have is 50 somewhere between, around 55 million years old but the age estimate for the uh, root of the, the crown age of butterflies is twice older we have this big fossil gap um, at least if we trust the molecular plots yeah, um, I was very interested in the mimic. Um, so that constrain the evolution of wing shape. So is there also a movement between wing shape or is it only in pattern? Um, I don't remember. Uh, so we should look, we haven't looked at all at this in uh, Ithamini, but I know the Helicomius um, community has, and I can't remember now what they found. Um, is it always... Um, Within one species, a single pattern, or do you also? Get I don't know. You have uh, polymorphism, uh, so different species can have it. Uh, and, uh, in the yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I can just mention is that size doesn't matter, for example, uh, because you can have the same color pattern, but uh, butterflies that are twice larger and they seem to be functioning equally. So birds don't seem to be discriminating the size, but really the pattern. For flight for for shape, I don't remember in the community. Um, it might be because you have um, the hypothesis also that some species are also mimicking, but that's maybe more for the base in mimicry. Some species are mimicking the flight behavior as well to look more like uh, their models, which probably affect it in shape too. So let, let me ask a question also on the uh, uh, you the sliding landmarks on the outside of the, the wings, and then you have the internal landmarks also that come from the bifurcation. Yeah. Uh, do you think so? You also talk about automating it all, and uh, so the sliding landmarks getting the outline is somewhat easier in an automation process potentially than getting the internal landmarks. Is it worthwhile going for the internal landmark to should you include them in order to make the analysis or can we do it with the outline? My intention would be to work on the outline. Yeah. Um again, because also you have the problem of finding the, the, the landmarks, the same landmarks everywhere, and we, we already know that we, we will not. Um in theory, you would have potentially interesting, interesting um variation within the wings um but i don't i don't see any clear kind of um, question that i would be addressing by just focusing on the internal landmarks um whereas i think the outline provides you much more information because it links to the 
to the, the, the way the, the butterfly flies. Um, it gives you also the size information, which, which is, I think, more accurate than, than the, the, if you focus only on the internal animals. Um, so right now, for me, I'm just, in the future, just focusing, one to only focus on the outline. Um, but, and you can't automatically extract landmarks in, within. It has to be uh, my because I mean, for example, you have for uh, fly wings, you can do it because they're kind of totally transparent, and you can you can each program to identify the position of the the, the vanes section. But butterflies, as soon as there is scale and colors, sometimes it's even with the human eye hard to actually find where the the vein interactions are. So. I was just, just going to add on that, though, as part of your developmental question at the end, though, you would need the internal stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, sense? yeah. So when we were talking about color patterns, yes, you definitely do want to have the internal. Uh, but I don't, yeah. But probably in this case, you just need to focus on the color patterns and not anymore on the vein intersection and things like that. Yeah. Although it has been shown that the vein positioning actually influences the way that color patterns develop. Right. So... So it's complex thing that would require a lot of, of different data, but, but we could start with just focusing on aligning color patterns first. And we now nowadays for this last uh, developmental thing, we, we actually have made a lot of progress on identifying actually even which genes are affecting which part of the ground time. So. Okay, thanks again.